everybody. My name is Dave Young. I'm with the Marketing Communications Group at Cor for Corning Gorilla Glass. So I'm not a techie, so be kind to me. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is design, but really it's going to be structural design of the devices and not the aesthetic design of the nice devices that you see that we have here featuring some of the OEMs. Um, a little background. Uh, we started out about 11 years ago making Gorilla Glass, and we did it at a thickness of 1.1 millimeters. The phones were pretty much little bricks. They didn't have a lot of uh, uh, flex to them. They were structurally very sound. They had rigid frames. They had bezels. So the glass was pretty much protected from doing a lot of movement. And I think from the presentation that Josh gave, there are two things that are required to break glass. One is surface flaw, and the other one is enough flexure or force to get down into the tension layer. So as we got thinner and thinner, if this were the same composition, by the time we get down to 0.4 millimeters, this glass wouldn't be as tough as the thick glass. It just stands to reason. So each time we would get thinner, we would change the composition of the glass to make it tougher. So you could either have as tough a glass at a thinner thickness or tougher glass at the same thickness, which leads me again into the design. What I'm going to do today is take the same piece of glass, it's just a generic chemically strengthened glass, and show you that the design of the structure of the device makes a difference in the durability of the glass itself. I'm going to use the same piece to do the experiment, and that's so I'm comparing apples to apples. And it's what we're going to be comparing the two structures. This one has completely solid surface so that it's supported completely on the back surface of the glass. This one in the center has a neoprene filling a hole, so there's going to be some flexure in the glass. This is an impact hammer. I'm going to be putting a force of about 0.7 joules onto the glass. It's basically going to pound the surface of the glass. And this is laminated. That's not what the glass looks like that we sell to our customers. It's a real nice, pristine piece of glass like that. So let's try the fully supported structure first. Back the hammer. Hit it in the center. And you can see it here on the TV if you can't see it in front. And the glass survived. We're going to do the same thing on the not fully supported structure. And this time the glass didn't fare so well. So we try to work with our OEMs and tell them the things that we've learned about how you support the glass, how you fixture the glass to increase the probability of the glass surviving. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Scott. And he's going to tell you a little bit about the more the aesthetic design of the glass. Okay, thanks, Dave. I'm Scott Torrey. I'm on the product line management team for Gorilla Glass. And one of the trends you've heard about in the keynote presentations was about the use of glass as a material on the backs of phones. And really, uh, there's two aspects to that. One is it provides designers um, an artistic or art piece. And we have on display here uh, multiple devices from different OEMs. They're using Gorilla Glass on the back. You can see it provides a thin, sleek, elegant design. And on your next tour stop, you're going to get more into the innovations Corning is providing in this space um, and what you'll see moving forward. The other piece is that glass provides um, a number of um, things from a science perspective, and glass is on the right side of the technology curve. And there's two things we wanted to highlight today. So one is that glass is transparent to radio frequency waves or RF waves. So what we have here in the front is two different phones. This is the front and the back, and the front and the back, to get a sense of what the phones look like inside, um, the components. You can see there's not a whole lot of space. And we've also labeled here where the antennas are placed for cellular, for Wi-Fi, and for near-field communications. And now if you can imagine, a designer has to figure out where to place more and more antennas moving forward. We start getting into 5G networks. 
you've got more frequency bands and you know higher frequencies with millimeter waves in MIMO, so multiple input, multiple output formats, that by having a material glass that provides more flexibility with getting the RF signal in and out, you know, it definitely is a help from a design perspective. The other thing we wanted to talk from a science perspective is wireless charging. So what I have here, hope you can see it up here as well, is just a device. We've got an app installed that shows the electrical charge status of the phone. So the two circles here, you're seeing volts and amps. So if it's orange in color, it's not being charged. And then if I put it on this fast charger, you'll see that it changes to green, meaning that it's charged, as you'd expect. But if I take a thin piece of metal, this is 50 microns, and I put it in between the charger and the phone, you can see that the charging is not occurring. And it makes sense, right? The metal is interfering with the electromagnetic field that is used by the inductive charging. If I take that metal out, glass being a dielectric, even if I put multiple pieces in here, and I put the phone back on, and it goes back to charging again. This is one of the main reasons why you're seeing glass being adapted on backs. It's enabling wireless charging and the other benefit of the RF transparency. So those are the main things Dave and I wanted to highlight from a design perspective.